has paid the highest price and He has proven His great love for us So we will praise Him with our lives And proclaim our love for Him Proclaim our love for him. I have heard a sound coming on the wind, changing hearts and minds, and healing brokenness. I feel a generation.
thank you, worship team. Good morning, ZPC. Good morning. It is really good to see so many new faces that are either returning or perhaps some of you have uh, been able to join us now since your spring break has concluded. It looks like some of you carry your son a little bit better than some of us, or you were out working in the yard enjoying this nice weather yesterday. Regardless, it's wonderful to have, us, have you with us this morning. We want to welcome in the live streamers as well for the 930. We would certainly encourage you as you're feeling comfortable to come join us in this increasingly uh, busy but nonetheless safe sanctuary. We look forward to seeing you at ZPC again soon. And for those of you who may be joining us after Easter for the first time to try the indoor version, we welcome you especially and hope you enjoy your visit today. Along those lines, you're going to see in front of you a QR code that looks like that. You can also scan that one. For those of you who are joining us uh, for the first time, just put your phone up to that, turn on the camera, scan that, and that will get you access to the bulletin. If you're looking for that, you can also check in and let us know that you're here. Next, we want to thank you for your generosity. Obviously, the uh, continued generosity during this time is a blessing not only to all of us here at ZPC, but all the ministries that we support. You have three different ways, as always, to give. You can give online, you can give via text, and then we also have boxes at the back of the sanctuary on your way out. So we thank you for that continued generosity. We have a couple of announcements for you this morning. Uh, first of all, in a couple of weeks, on May 2nd, we've got a congregational meeting. That'll be after the 11 o'clock service. We're going to be voting on some pretty important things. We always do when we have a congregational meeting. It's not just a rocking good time. We're going to be voting on the uh, nomination committee, but then we're also going to be voting on the food pantry. And along with that is a transition to more information on the food pantry. If you missed the uh, internet crashing on Thursday night, that was due to the new visual identity being announced at the meeting on Thursday night. For those of you who weren't here, uh, we're going to take a look at a video here in just a minute, but I want to make sure that you understand if you weren't here, you didn't see the live stream, you also have the opportunity to go out online and take a look at that link. We looked at that this morning. It's a two-hour video. It's a two-hour meeting, rather, so there is a fast-forward option, so you can't break the link, so feel free to drag through that and get to the information that you're most interested in. But with that and this new visual identity, which means a lot of things to a lot of people these days, let's take a look at the video. But he brought me in Oh, his love for me Oh, his love for me Who the sun sets free Oh, he's free indeed I'm a child of God Yes, I A slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died for me. Who the Son sets free, oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child. Child of 
says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. As we've just sung, I am chosen and not forsaken. I am who you say that I am. If we want to say those words with belief and with conviction, Jesus is saying, come after me now. I've chosen you. I've not forsaken you but it's gonna cost us something. He tells us it costs us something. So Holy Spirit, come and reveal to us what is hindering our hearts from following you.
Before we pray together, we'd like to acknowledge um, the terrible tragedy that happened at the FedEx facility here at our Indianapolis airport this week. And like all of those around the country, we're shocked and saddened again at this terrible loss of life. And so we want to add our prayers to those around our city and our nation for the victims and the families and even for ourselves. And with that, let us pray. Most loving God, it is a joy and comforting to be with you today, here in this sanctuary or joining in worship at home. It is a joy to hear and these praise songs and hymns, to hear your word, to listen to a message, to share the same faith with our friends. Bless us, O oh God, we pray, to be encouraged by our faith in you that we would experience you and then that we may live for you. And yet, O oh God, we are reminded even again, even again this week that we live in a broken world. We are reminded as a shooting causes the death of eight of our neighbors and injures many others. So we pray for many things. We pray for the victims that they knew you and are known by God, for their families and loved ones, that you bring them comfort and support in their time of need. We pray for the workers at the FedEx facility that will go back to work with the loss of some of their coworkers. And in light of all this, God, we ask you to help people to turn their hearts, their very lives, to you so that violence will not be so much of a choice. We pray for ourselves that through our own actions and thoughts, we may see places where we may be of service to others, to our neighbors, and like the Good Samaritan a week ago, to help that person who is hurting and needs our help. God, bring about change in us so that we may help to bring about change and bring about your kingdom in the world. We thank you for our worship leaders. We ask that you continue to bless them as they lead us this morning. Our student ministry leaders, our students and children as they learn about you, O oh God. And bless Pastor Jerry as he leads us again learning from Jesus in the Gospels. For ourselves and our, for, and our church family, we pray as well. God, when we fall short, help us to see that, to admit it, to get back up and to follow you again, knowing that you love us and care for us. Forgive us, O oh God, where we deed and make us new and connect to you. Help us, O oh God, to count to the cost and to choose to follow you. We ask that you bless those in need in our church family. We pray for Joe Mundell and Jim Baldoff, Landon Rockensus, Ben Jones, Becky First, for healing for all of them and for those in our lives that we know need healing as well. We pray for Jim Crismore in the loss of his mother and for all of those who have experienced loss. Bless all those who need you in a special way today. And now, O oh God, what a joy and a privilege it is to pray together. So we pray as Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi, and good morning again to everyone on this beautiful Sunday. It feels like we've had a lot of wonderful spring days of late. So we complain when it's bad, but we should be celebratory when it is good. Amen. And again, let me just remind you that if you weren't able to be here uh, or weren't able to watch it uh, at home, uh, the informational meeting, please do uh, take a look at that. Uh, we'd love for you. The more that you know, um, um, the more helpful it is for us. And so we've got a lot of good things moving forward. And so we look forward to, uh, to that and seeing where the Lord continues to lead us in the days ahead. So this morning we are continuing our 
series on grace dangerous. And as I said at the 8 o'clock, in many ways, today feels like um, the day when Jesus is putting the dangerous in grace dangerous. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see how this goes. You never really know, um, but uh, I will at least be preaching two more sermons, this one and the one at 11. Amen? We'll see if you say that at the end. Here we go. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. Here is what Luke tells us. Now large crowds were traveling with him, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. They throw it away. Let anyone with ears to hear Listen, sisters and brothers in Christ, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, at times you speak to us in ways that draw us in, that make us feel comfortable. At other times, Lord, your words make us want to run and hide. Wherever we may be this morning, my hope and prayer, Lord, is that you would help us to have the ears to hear. Lower those parts of us, Lord, that long to be defensive and to protect ourselves. That we might then know what it means to truly follow you. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen and amen. One of the, one of the fun things about going through uh, the New Testament together as we've been doing uh, communally and with great intentionality, is the fact that as we do so, uh, it gives us some common ground to to be able to talk about, you know, as we've been reading through the chapters of the Bible, what are those places that we are noticing? What are the things we're noticing? It's been enjoyable to have some of those conversations over the last couple of months or so. And uh, one of the things, uh, I was having a conversation with somebody a few weeks ago, and they were saying something about, you know, it's the first time that this person had ever really just kind of slowly read through uh, the New Testament like this. And, and what this person said to me was, you know, I got to tell you that Jesus is nowhere near as soft and cuddly as I had always assumed that he was. I thought that was a great insight, and of course, it's really quite true. There is this dramatic difference between perceived Jesus and actual Jesus. I think that there are many, both inside and outside of the church, who when they think about Jesus, uh, they just think about him as being a friend, a confidant, uh, perhaps someone to give us a warm and gentle hug in a cold and heartless world. And to be sure... Jesus is one who comforts. To be sure, 
Jesus is one in whom we can find peace even in the most difficult of times. But Jesus is also more than just that. Jesus is also the one who demands allegiance. Jesus is also the one who demands that we worship him and him alone. And so if we only understand one part of Jesus, then we don't really understand who Jesus was and what Jesus calls us to do and to be. Now, let's be clear. The fault of that skewed version of Jesus is not his. No, no, it is, it is ours completely because Jesus was continually trying to be abundantly clear of what exactly it cost to follow him. Jesus was rarely kind of mincing words in this thing. We see this today, of course. There is Jesus and the, the, the congregation, or I guess it's not a congregation, the crowd around him is beginning to swell, right? It's getting larger and larger. And can you just picture this? I pictured it for myself. If, if that was happening and more and more people were following me or listening to me, I would, I would have a tendency to want to kind of mute things a little bit, to want to be a little bit gentler, to soften some of those hard edges because man it would feel really good to be trending wouldn't it it feel really good to have people after you say something come up to you and say oh it was inspirational oh you moved me it was it was remarkable much more so than having people get angry at you or or even worse perhaps not even looking at you and just walking past and never following you or looking at you again that would make sense to many of us, but this was not what Jesus wanted. In fact, it seems almost that Jesus went out of his way in order to confront this burgeoning crowd. Because we're told that as Jesus was going, he turns to them. In other words, if he had just kept walking, you know, and maybe done a, a you know, from time to time, just a little glance and be like, oh yeah, there's more. And just kind of did this, right? That would have been great, but Jesus turns to them with this highly intentional move. Nobody had said, hey, Jesus, just wondering, uh, what's it like to be your disciple? What's it mean to follow you? No, no, no. Jesus wanted to be abundantly clear what it was going to cost them if they wanted to follow him. There was not, as someone has said, any fine print when it comes to Jesus. So he begins, of course, I'm sure you noticed it, by saying that you need to hate your family. Now that's something. We're going to get to it in a moment. But after talking about that, he then goes on to give two analogies. He says, just a picture, if you will, that you were wanting to build a tower. You wouldn't be so foolish, would you, as to not think about, not count whether you have enough money so that then you build a foundation and you think, oh man, I should have done the math. I, got, I cannot finish this thing. No way, he says. They would mock you endlessly. They would ridicule you if you had done such a thing. And you notice that the crowd, I mean, you're thinking they're like, oh yeah, oh, that's totally true. They would mock you. That guy's dumb. That reminds me of a neighbor I have. He'd do something dumb like that. And he says, oh, or what if you're a king? Imagine you're a king and you're about to go to war and you're thinking, okay, you don't just willy-nilly go into war. You better count how many soldiers you have and how many soldiers they have. And if you got 10,000 and they got 20,000, that is not good odds. You better find somebody who's going to make peace with the other kingdom. And the crowd around him is like, you betcha. I love this Jesus guy. He's really sharp. I love it. And this is the thing, right, is when you, when you talk in analogies or when you talk in generalities, it is really easy for everyone to like exactly what it is that you are saying. It's really easy to get on board because usually we put ourselves in the smart person's role, right? Oh, yeah, I'd be the one who wouldn't build a tower. Oh, yeah, I'd be the one who wouldn't go to war again. Those are my friends. They're all kind of dumb. I'm smart. I love this Jesus guy and they're all nodding and I'm like "Woo, Jesus let's do this and then Jesus says yeah all right so sell everything you have and come follow me hmm? oh Jesus I gotta run but I will be back slowly but surely the crowds begin, as one commentator has said, to thin out. 
that. But Jesus is not done. Because again, Jesus likes to be abundantly clear. And so he says, you know what it's like. Um, If you try to follow me without counting the cost, if you try to follow me without sacrificing anything, you know what it's like. It's like salt that has lost its saltiness. It is worth absolutely nothing. In fact, let's, be, let's, let's use Jesus, let's use his actual words. Basically, he's, what he says is, you know, if, if your discipleship is the one that doesn't cost anything and is not sacrificial, it ain't worth manure. It ain't worth manure. Some of you are thinking something else. Whoa. I mean, Jesus, Jesus is, is not hemming and hawing here, is he? Jesus is being incredibly clear about this. I love, you know, he, he, he's no timeshare time share sales person. He's not, you know, showing you pictures of like beaches and palm trees and sun and, and, and lobster dinners for free and, and free nights lodging. And, and then once you go there, then all of a sudden you begin to experience the actual cost of what it means. Jesus is not doing any of that. He is saying from the very beginning, this is going to cost you everything. I love what Fred Craddock says here, which is that Jesus, it seems, is much less concerned with how difficult it might be to follow him. He is much more concerned about unreflective enthusiasm. Much more concerned with unreflective enthusiasm. Much more concerned with those who say, yeah, we'll go. Jesus would prefer to have 10 or 11 or 12 disciples who really have counted the cost and who are willing to sacrifice everything than to have hundreds or thousands of those who say, yeah, let's do this, Jesus. And as soon as things become challenging, then they bail on him in no time at all. Jesus wanted you to know it would be costly. Now, here's the thing. We in the church, we as pastors, we get this. We know what Jesus says. We just think that maybe it would be good to do a different strategy. And I don't think we do it because we're bad people, right? But we just kind of tend to soften those edges to kind of sand out, make a little smoother the cross, to make Jesus more relevant, to focus on the ways he's going to help you be a better you, to try to figure out how can we make sure that people don't really count the cost all that much, or at least that they don't really know what the cost is. But we do it really, not always, but typically, because we we want people to follow Jesus. We, we really do want them to do that. We want people to come and be a part of this community. And if you, if you start the way Jesus starts, well, it's just not very good. And, but what, of course, what's funny is that the same people, i.e. pastors, who, who, who try to soften everything and try to tell you that it's going to be comfortable and easy to follow Jesus, we're also the people who, when people aren't willing to give of their time or talent or treasure sacrificially, we're the same people who get angry. Which is bizarre because we've spent all this time telling you that it should be fairly easy and comfortable to follow Jesus. And then we get upset when you believe us. But Jesus was saying, no, 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 no. Oh, no. This is what it's going to cost you. And to showcase that, Jesus goes for the jugular. Jesus hits at the very heart and mind and soul of the Jewish community. Jesus takes on the family. Maybe you forgot what he said. My guess is you didn't, but let's just remember it again. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, Brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Okay, fine, I'll say it again. Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. 
Now, here's the thing. You think family is important to you. Family is nowhere near as important to you as it was to the Jewish community in this time and in this place because it was much more than just who you had relationships with, who you had the same bloodline. No, no, no. It was your status in the community. When you were ill, your family was the hospital. When you retired, your family was your pension and your 401k. The family was everything. When Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you need to hate all of your family, it was an attack on the very core of who they were. It was an act of warfare. Now, I want to remind you guys of something, which is something that I started our sermon series on a few months back, whenever that was, January 17th. That's when it was. I told you, I told you all two things. One, that when we're going through this New Testament, we were going to look at passages that were going to be a struggle, that were not going to be nearly as gentle as we had hoped. I think we've done that thus far. And secondly, I was going to do my best to not try to soften those passages. I feel like, by and large, I have tried to do that. I'm not perfect, but I have tried to kind of live up to that. I say that as a precursor because it may look like what I'm doing in just a second is trying to soften this passage, and maybe I am. But I actually think what I'm trying to do is give it some context so that we understand more fully exactly what Jesus is saying and what he's not saying. Jesus says, hate all of your family. But if you've been reading the Gospels, you also know that Jesus says, love your mother and father. That he also says, love your neighbor. That he also says, love you, even your enemy. So is Jesus talking out of two sides of his mouth here? What's going on? Well, one of the things that we need to understand is in the Semitic usage of this word hate. Sometimes it can mean, as Tim Keller points out, exactly what we mean. It's very active. It just means you hate somebody. But other times, the Semitic usage of the word hate actually means more of a comparative hate. So, by way of example, in Genesis, where you have Jacob, who uh, has two wives, uh, Rachel and Leah. And we're told in Genesis that Jacob loves Rachel and he hates Leah. But then as you begin to discover, he doesn't actually hate Leah. But rather, it is a comparative, which means that his love for Leah, while there, is vastly overshadowed by his love for Rachel. So that really, more than likely, if we understand Jesus well, what's going on here is that Jesus is saying, hey, listen here, you know what? You need to love Jesus so much that even your family in their love seems a distant second. You can barely make them out over the horizon, but it should be overshadowed by your love and your commitment to me. But what we also have to realize is even when we understand it in that context, that Jesus was still very much trying to jar those followers. He was still very much trying to catch them unaware, to shock them in some way. I like what Keith Nickel says about this. He says that even when you understand it within this context of comparative hatred or love, if you will, even then we cannot ignore the urgency and the radical, even dangerous, I like that word, dimensions always implicit in following Jesus. In other words, if you hear these words of Jesus and you are not made uncomfortable, or you are not angry, then there is a great chance that you have softened his words far too much. One of the questions that we preachers ask when preaching on a text, whatever it may be, is how can we preach this text and be faithful to it? 
Because when you read a passage like this one, where Jesus is clearly trying to be provocative, he's clearly trying to call out idols that we'd prefer to not call out. He's clearly trying to thin the crowd. He's clearly trying to make people angry and uncomfortable. He's clearly trying to count the cost. It is hard to preach on this passage without at least in some way doing the same. So that if I were to have said to you before I read the passage, who here would like for me to preach faithfully whatever passage it is, you all would get as Pentecostal as you all ever get, which is to say, woo, yes, absolutely do it. I mean, that's why we come to this place. We want you to preach it faithfully, right? Geez, the eight o'clock actually agreed with me. So you all, I might be questioning here. But if I read that passage about hating your mother and your father and your brother and your children and your sisters and then said, do you want me to be faithful to this passage? You would say, yes. Can you just tell us enough so that we don't get angry and we're still mostly comfy and nothing has to change because that's what we want. At least that's what I usually want. On Wednesday, uh, I was talking to our worship team, and we were asking how to be faithful to this particular passage. How do we preach it and be faithful? And it was suggested that maybe what we should do is that I should stand up here, not what we should do. It's always me. What should I? I should stand up here and preach and preach and preach on this passage and the difficulty of this passage until finally someone leaves. I told them to leave right now. They're getting their children for baptism. Don't worry. But at least now the rest of you know which way to go when you decide to leave. I decided uh, that that wasn't exactly the tack I was going to take, that we weren't, I wasn't going to just keep preaching until someone leaves and then I could give the benediction and we could all go home. But I also realized that it would be taking the easy way out and it would be very unfaithful to Jesus if we just kept this in generalities. If I just kind of said, hey, have you counted the cost? Hey, have you sacrificed something? All right, great job. Or hey, do better next time, amen. And so I had to ask myself, what are those real places in our lives where perhaps we are tempted at worshiping them closely to the same way that we worship Jesus? Or what are those places where we struggle to truly count the cost or we struggle to truly sacrifice and we aren't quite yet willing to go there? And interestingly enough, I don't know what this means, but it kind of bubbled up within me almost demographically. Now, this is not always the case, uh, but, but it almost was like I could see some, old, I see, I see some older group, I see a younger group, I see a, a middle-aged group, and, and, and some things that maybe they wrestle with. And, and these things, not everyone does in that age group, and sometimes you skip around in age groups, but it's just something that probably over the last 16 years of being a pastor, I have kind of felt and experienced. For instance, with our older demographic, there are times when I am struck by how some of these disciples can confuse the kingdom of America with the kingdom of God. And where it seems, though they would never explicitly say this, that they worship almost both of these things, God and country, at the same level. Now, I always have to give this caveat. Let me be clear. I'm happy to be an American. My father served in the Navy. My sister served in the Air Force. My brother-in-law serves in the Army even now. If I had known I was going to be a pastor earlier in life, I feel quite certain I would have been a chaplain in the military. I'm happy to be an American, but I have frequently been struck during my time as a pastor with the vehemence and the downright anger 
that I have experienced around things like whether or not there should be an American flag in the sanctuary. You can look, it's not in here right now. Or around July 4th with, you know what? We should sing God bless America. Why do we not sing God bless America? People have left the church because they have felt that I have not been patriotic enough for them. And so here's what I want to say. If you want to leave the church because you feel like we are not preaching Christ, his cross and him crucified and dead and raised for us, my blessing to you. If you can find a church that you think is doing a better job, then by all means. But if you are leaving the church because there is not an American flag in the sanctuary, then I am left wondering what you would have said to Jesus when he looked at you. And I promise you he would look at you because if he brought up the family, he would bring up the nation. And he said, if you want to follow me, you have to hate America. Which means, again, let me remind you that your love for country, it can be there, but it must be vastly overshadowed by your love of God. Nothing can be nearly as important. They got real quiet at the eight, too. Well, what about our younger demographic? That doesn't tend to be the thing that they want to die on. That's not the thing that they typically get upset about. For them, I'm oftentimes struck by the almost radical individualism and the demand for freedom to do whatever he or she wants without anyone having the right to question it at all. There is a fierce defense of being able to do whatever I want with my body, whatever I want with whomever I want, whatever I want with anything you can think of, and no one, not even God himself, can question it. It makes sense to me when the society does that, but what I wonder is for those followers of Jesus who ask that same question I wonder what they might say when Jesus says to them, as he said to the crowd on that day, that you must hate even your own life. To put it more acutely, you must hate even your own rights if you want to be my disciple. Hear me again. You were created by God. I'm not suggesting you shouldn't love how God has created you. But I am suggesting that you need to ask the question of whether or not you love Jesus more than being able to do whatever it is that you long to do. But what about the middle-aged demographic? And by this I mean me and those like me. I didn't actually want to bring this up. In fact, I talked to two staff members to see, I, don't, I really don't ever do that, whether or not I should say this. One of them said yes, but that person wants me fired, and the other one was wishy-washy. I want you to hear me, my friends, when I say this. I am oftentimes struck by how frequently we seem almost every time to prioritize our children's activities on Sunday morning over worship. Now hear me. I'm not suggesting that your child should never miss worship for something else. I am certain that there will come a time in the future when my children will periodically miss for one thing or another. And please hear me. I understand some of the reasons why this happens. 
oftentimes there's a sense, and I know it because you've told me, that it's because of the fact that, well, you know, I'm afraid that if we say no to whatever else that might be, that then they're going to not like church, that then they're going to turn away from God. I get it. I have four pastor's kids. PKs are notorious for being in the church so much that they end up hating God and hating the church. I am constantly afraid of that. But here is what I also know, and you can wrestle with this, and you can tell me I'm wrong, and that's fine. But what is important to you is what you sacrifice for. And if you do not sacrifice something, and if your children do not feel the sacrifice, then you are telling them it is not as important as whatever else it is you may be doing. We can tell them until the cows come home. But our children are wondering, our children will be shaped by what it is that we sacrifice and what it is that we call them to sacrifice. Now, I'll tell you why I decided finally to say this. It's Bodhi's fault. Bodhi is the child that we're going to be baptizing soon. What I realized is this. I have made a commitment to Bodhi. And when we stand up here and we pour the water and we say what we're going to say, we are making a commitment to that child to help shape that child, to help this child grow in the faith. What I realized was, doggone it, it actually kind of teed me off. That I can promise you, coaches and directors and teachers and instructors are having no problem telling our kids and their parents that they need to be here. And if they aren't there, then this horrible thing is going to happen. But if they do come, then this amazing thing is going to happen. And what I realized was I'm over here scared to death to be true to the commitment I made when I am scared to simply say, you have a choice. And I love you and I love your children too much to simply allow all of these other voices to drown out the call of discipleship. I don't know how to look at this passage without believing that Jesus is saying that if you are following him and you are being his disciple and it is not costing you something, then the truth is you aren't actually following Jesus. I tried all week come up with a different sermon. I would prefer a softer Jesus. An easier one. But I also want to be clear about this. That in the very next chapter, chapter 15, Jesus tells parable after parable after parable about how God is like those who seek after the lost. That even those who run away, perhaps even those for whom think it's too costly or too dangerous or too sacrificial, even for them, Jesus will come running after you. And I also appreciate what someone has said about the cross and discipleship, this comparison, which is simply this, that crucifixion was not a fast death. It was a slow, arduous one. So too is discipleship gradual. Though it may feel 
like too much of a cost today. My hope is that you would have the courage to try and to keep following. Because you might just be surprised how as you continue on this journey, you begin to give up more and more as you taste and see that the Lord is good. Jesus knew that we flourished only through the resurrection. But that's how we got new life. That's the good news. The challenging news is that he also knew that the only way to experience that is when we are willing to sacrifice and die. The very end, Jesus simply ends this part of the story with these questions. Are you listening to this? Really listening? Let us pray. God, we admit that it is a struggle to know what it means to follow you sacrificially. That it is costly, and we don't want it to be. So I pray that you would give us the courage to keep following you. And as we do so, that you would have the grace to forgive us when we fail. The strength to empower us when we are weak. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. As I said, we're blaming it on Bodhi today. And so I am uh, inviting the walkers to come on. The walkers. Walker, the brother, as well as uh, Kelly and Jordan Brewer, if they would come forward now. And Amanda Witter as our uh, elder, if you would come forward as well. And um, we have the privilege of baptizing Bodhi on this day. Bodhi, it feels like if you had better days, brother. <laughs> All right. Well, we are excited to come around and to baptize today. And so let me um, begin by asking Jordan and Kelly, uh, you two, these questions. Do you claim Jesus Christ as your Savior? And do you claim Jesus as Lord and leader of your lives? Do you? And will you raise this child with the guidance and teaching of the Lord as given in the scriptures? Will you? All right. Now it's your turn. So, as I said, we asked the congregation a question, and this is the question for you all. Amanda, would you please do that? be a faithful member of this church. Do we? Yeah. All right, and let us pray. God, we pray that just as you came into the chaos of our world, that you brought life and light and hope. We pray, too, that you will come over Bodhi on this day. We thank you, Lord, for this child and we pray that he would feel and experience the death and the resurrection of new life in you. That in the days and weeks and months and years ahead, that his family, his friends, and that we would be able to shape him more and more into one who follows you, no matter the cost. And it's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, I'm going to let you guys do this. I'm almost fully vaccinated. When that happens, I will put my hands in the water again, but not yet. So, and remember what I said. The more grace you feel like he's going to need, the more water you're going to need to put on him. So, <laughs> let's get ready for that. And if some of it sprinkles over on the walker, that's fine. And even Kelly. All right, we ready? <laughs> Bodie Martin, I baptize you in the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. In the name of the Holy Spirit, 
No matter how much you may want to resist it, Bodhi, (laughs) you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as his own. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. All right, let's welcome them into... uh, All right, and here is a certificate and a children's Bible for you, Bodhi, and um, we welcome you, brother, into our community. All right, you can go ahead and have a seat and maybe get a hair dryer or something. Um, good, why don't we stand? One of the things that you may notice is that when we do baptisms, we don't say the last name. We say the first name and we say the middle name. And then in many ways, it's coinciding with what Jesus is saying, which is just the sense that, yes, we love our biological family. My mother happens to be here today. Bad timing. And so we love them. But we also know that we are being brought into a new spiritual family. And that's the beauty of baptism, it seems to me. And it is this reminder that we are called to leave whatever behind we must If we are going to follow Jesus, no matter the cost and no matter the sacrifice. And may we do so. And as we do so, may you remember the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit until he returns and we are all resurrected with him. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Cause it leads me to you 